Good morning. We are continuing our study of Genesis this morning. If you want to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 34. It's my personal experience and opinion that parenting is both the most joyous and the most heartbreaking endeavor God calls us to engage in. Namely because when we as parents do everything within our power to point our children to God, urging them to walk in his ways, many times we have to learn the heartbreaking reality that, as it's often been said, grace does not run in the blood. To look at the other side of that same coin, kinship with a Christian does not make you one. Our children, to varying degrees, can and will be drawn to the magnetism of sin and choose to walk in the ways of the wicked. Today, as we continue to learn from the narrative of Jacob's life, we will see this reality in full display. The title of our message this morning is The Allure of the World. Let's bow in prayer before we hear from God. Father, we... As we sang earlier, Lord, we have the pure holiness of Jesus imparted to us as a free gift, and yet the sinful host of our bodies corrupts it day by day in our actions and our thoughts. And then we live in the context of a whole world that's corrupted by sin, that's polluted in control of the evil one. And so we pray that you would use your word today. Use what you did in Jacob's life, Lord, and by your Holy Spirit, convict us where we are imbibing the magnetism of the world instead of loving you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you'll recall from chapter 32, if you were with us, the night when Jacob was lying on the banks of the Jabbok River, and the angel of the Lord came and wrestled him into submission, and then blessed him by changing his name to Israel. Israel limped away from that majestic encounter, walking by faith in the promises that God would protect him from the wrath of his brother, who he had wronged several times as a youth. And by God's grace, you may remember, Esau did forgive him when they met and invited him to his home in Seir. But Jacob, reverting to his old deceptive self, responded with a half-truth. He said, well, I'll just, I'll come, I'll tell you what, I'll come visit you in due time. How about that? Even though Jacob was headed in the right direction towards the promised land, he did not go far enough. He was supposed to go all the way back to Bethel, where 20 years earlier he had vowed to God that he would return. Remember that? He said, if God does this, if God provides for me, he will be my God, and I'll give him a tenth of everything that I own. But the allure of good trade and convenience led Jacob to settle right outside of the prosperous city of Shechem, some 20 miles shy of Bethel. He mistakenly thought that partial obedience to God's command was the same as full obedience, or it was close enough. And we'll see today that he thought that we could blend in the goodness of the world like some custom coffee drink, and it'll be acceptable to God. And that apple of attraction to the world did not fall far from Jacob's tree, because not only were his children lured into the lured unwittingly into the ways of the pagan society around them, but their poor judgment wreaked havoc on and devastating consequences on the whole family of Israel. Pick up with me in verses one and two of chapter thirty four. <clears throat> now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamar the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, 
he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. You may remember Dinah, as we listed Jacob's children. She was, as far as we know, Jacob's only daughter. She was the daughter of Leah, who Jacob kind of only tolerated, but she was still his only daughter, and she is here likely about 15 or 16 years old. And so what the rule of the culture was, not just Israel, but really the whole Middle Eastern region, was a girl of marriable age, which throughout history, 15 or 16, has been a marriable age, was not allowed, not permitted to leave the home area without a chaperone for good reason. Dinah would have had to sneak out without anyone knowing, without Leah knowing, without any of her brothers knowing. Why would, why would she do that? What would possess her to break that hard and fast rule? You do not, for your protection, you do not go out without a chaperone. Matthew Henry aptly says, she not only wanted to see, but to be seen. Doesn't that describe our heart? We, we not only desire to know or to see what everyone else is up to, but we want people to know and see us as well. Whether you realize it or not, that's the impulse that social media is built upon. Whether it's the verbal X or Twitter, you want to make your opinion. You want to see what other people's opinions are, but you want to make your opinion known too, or the more visual forms of social media. You want to both see and be seen. Dinah could relate to that well if she were here because as she spawned into womanhood, she had grown tired of just hanging out with her brothers and her mom. It's boring. She wanted to go check out the world, see what it had to offer. She found out the hard way, the first thing God wants to teach you and I this morning and that is the allure of the world is actually a trap. Traps are all designed to catch the victim off guard. You know that in your household. If you have those sticky traps for flies, they smell something sweet, innocently fly up there, and all of a sudden they're glued to cardboard forever. Or if you bait an old-fashioned mouse trap, he's nibbling on cheese and is surprised, caught off guard when the bar comes down on his neck. All traps, whether physical or spiritual, rely on the element of surprise to ensnare their unsuspecting victims. Spiritual captivity is no different. With our understanding at least partially occluded by our desires, when we're driven by our desires and and our understanding is, is marred by that, it's, it's clouded, it's occluded by that, we're an easy catch for Satan to ruin our life. Remember, he prowls about. He's on the hunt. He prowls about seeking someone to devour. Dinah's seemingly innocent exploration suddenly resulted in a life-altering molestation. Three words describe the progression of this grotesque act. Shechem seized her, he lay with her, and then he humiliated her. Rape in any context is tragic. It stains the victim's understanding of God's purpose for sex. But this rape was especially harmful because it took place among God's chosen people in the formidable stages of God creating an earthly family for himself, a family that was to be distinct from the world, set apart as his holy nation. For the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, with the nation of Israel, God was creating for himself a visible earthly family that now serves as a type of his spiritual family, the church a family that could only be realized when a man, a new Adam, finally came who would be without sin, not only born without sin, but lived the perfect obedient life all the way up to sacrificing his own life on the cross. That a new family of new creations could be born not just of physical descent, 
but born again by the Holy Spirit, regenerating them and giving them faith in this Jesus, this new Adam. So that they're transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. They become part of God's family through uniting with his only son and heirs to his kingdom. We are now God's temple. God's Holy Spirit has now come to reside in us. This building is not his temple. This building is just brick and mortar and structure that we can meet as his temple in because his Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in the building. He dwells in us. And so Paul quotes and applies this Old Testament prophecy for us to obey. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. He's talking family here. Therefore, if you're part of God's family, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. We'll have fellowship. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And so he's not saying, do this, and then I'll be a father to you. He's saying, because I have done this for you, I've brought you, I've adopted you into my family, I've knitted you into my tribe, then live like Jesus, not like the world. When you understand that true identity as a, a member of Christ's body, a part of God's family, you have to learn to believe. And this is, young people, I know this is hard. You have to learn to believe that the purpose of God's commands, which are plainly given us here in Scripture, are not designed to restrict your enjoyment. Dinah was not commanded to stay home just to make her bored. But rather, God wants to preserve you from the traps of sin that are everywhere in the world so that you can have ultimate joy in fellowship with God. Thanks be to God. I hope you thank the Lord for this. We get to gather every Lord's Day and get a portion of that joy together as the temple of God is, is, is enjoying the presence of God through his Holy Spirit and singing the truth of God and, and praying the truth of God and imbibing the truth of God from his word. We are enjoying a portion of that joy. But a day is coming when we will, our joy, the joy will blow our circuits. We will be happy forever and ever and ever in the presence of our Father and the Lamb. Enemy number one of that communion is sin. And its seduction comes in many forms. Visual, audible, the serpent trains many of his own people in smooth and slippery talking. Dinah's rapist quickly decided he liked his, this forbidden fruit whom he had defrauded. Remember, she's a foreigner, right? Hey, who's this chick? Oh, she's the one of those Israelites. And he wanted to get his dad to get her for him. Verse 3. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, get me this girl for my wife. See, Hamor is listed as the prince of the land. He's in essence the king. But Shechem was so much the heir apparent, this darling boy, darling son, that they'd already named the city after him. In other words, Shechem was used to getting whatever he wanted. And so he starts to sweet talk both Dinah and his daddy to make her his own. I want her for me. 
keep in mind, Dinah is still being held captive in the same house where she was raped. She must have been thinking, when Dad hears about this, he'll come to my aid. But Jacob didn't. Look at verse 5. Now, Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah. But his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamar spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him for his wife. I'm not sure what the cultural norms for courtship were in Shechem, but I doubt that abusive rape was a norm for the first date. The wound, as some of you know too well, in it for everyone in Jacob's family was deep. It was shocking. If you or someone close to you has been horrifically wronged or abused, it's fitting to be grieved and anger, even angry at the sin especially when the crime like this one is just off the charts in horror. After all, this was Jacob's only daughter. But take note in verses 5 and following, Hamar didn't come to apologize. Remember how Job did that? When his sons, his children were out sinning grievously, he was repenting to God. That's not what Hamar's doing here. He's just on a mission to obtain what his darling son wanted. So he makes a citywide proposal by executive order, no less. Look at verse 9. Make marriages with us. He's still speaking to Jacob. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Hamar was asking these Israelites set apart for God to be his holy nation, to be one people with them. You're aware that in every country of the world, nothing integrates two people groups faster than mixed marriages. But this too was bait for a larger trap. That's the second thing you need to know about the allure of the world. Avarice. It's another word for greed. Is its favorite bait. Every trap has bait. Otherwise, it's just a trap. Nobody wants it. Hamor's appeal for intermarriage was not rooted in anything other than the false hope of financial security for Jacob and his family. Hey, y'all just come live with us and, and we'll integrate and, and, and you'll enjoy the wealth of the land. You'll enjoy financial security. He wanted dollar signs or whatever the Hivite currency was to flash in their minds in hopes that they would just overlook this trivial little mistake that Shechem made. Just come prosper together with us. You know, live and let live, all that. What Hamar was deceptively offering Israel was a shortcut to the very things God had promised to do for them in the promised land. Shechem joined in with even a little more of the same bait. Verse 11, Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. As for me, as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give you whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. At the bottom of every corruption in the world, you'll find the same fuel, greed. Every corruption, whether you're talking cartel or kings or presidents or common ordinary people like us, greed 
is the fuel for all corruption. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. But even for Christians, the idea of permanent financial security is so appealing to our flesh that it tempts us like giving candy to a child. For whenever felt needs are directing our lives, the allure of transferring our trust to wealth is eerily appealing. So Paul offers both a warning to believers and a solution to avarice, to greed. 1 Timothy 6, 8. But if we have food and clothing, I think that describes everybody here, with these we will be content or we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich, implying that anything other than food and clothing is that category, fall into temptation, into a snare. It's another word for a trap. Into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. He's talking self-inflicted wounds here. The security of genuine contentment is only possible through faith in God. Otherwise, our flesh will just... My dad used to call it, you got the I want us. You just, you, you just, we just want, we just want. We want what other people have. We want what we don't have. We, we just, we're this vacuum of want. It's only through faith in God. It's only being filled with God and believing that God is your father and that God promises to meet every need of yours because you are his child. That you can say no to greed. That you can say, God, thank you instead. Thankfulness is the antidote for greed. Thank you that I have clothes on my body, shoes on my feet, food in my mouth, food in my pantry. That's why God warns us strongly to beware of how tempting greed is. Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free. Note where the responsibility lies. You. Keep your life. Police your heart and mind. Keep it free from the love of money. Guard your heart from going towards this appetizing and alluring bait. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I, I will never leave you. If you're a Christian this morning and you would profess that God Almighty through his Holy Spirit dwells in your heart, that he has made you a part of his holy temple, that you have everlasting life, no matter what happens to this body you now dwell in. What more do you want? He wants to liberate you from wasting your life doing what the Gentiles do, seeking their best life now. He wants you free from that. He don't want you in bondage to that. He don't want you having to walk around dragging the ball of chain of chasing empty pursuits. Who instead wants us to join together and build his eternal kingdom. And he continually empowers us to do that by his personal presence. So here is God's covenant proposal to you. Here is God's promise of security. I will never leave you or forsake you. And he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. You're precious in my sight. Neither Jacob nor his sons had the benefit of that promise like you do. But even if they had, they were not walking by faith in anything but their own passion for revenge. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamar deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you 
that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter and we will be gone. Remember that much of Jacob's life, he was a trickster. That was his name, deceiver. He deceived his brother and later his father to get what he wanted. And apparently his sons had inherited those same carnal tendencies. Our third point is that if you fall for the allure of the world, deceit becomes your new norm. You know what Satan's main character quality is, right? His main identifying attribute is he's the father of lies. He just lies all the time. One sure indicator that you have succumbed to walking in the devil's ways is that you increasingly think nothing of shading the truth. Sometimes you just outright lie to get what you want or to cover up something you've done in getting what you want. Deceit then is just the fruit of a heart set on something other than God. When we lie, when we tell a, a half truth, when we say something intentionally dis, in a deceptive way, it's just the fruit that our heart is not set on God at that moment. And there's grace to repent of that. There's grace to repent even now if you, God has brought to your mind some deceit in your life. There's grace to go to people whom you've deceived and ask their forgiveness. When your heart is set on something other than God, it's called idolatry. And that idolatrous heart will increasingly lead you, increasingly, like you, you may have experienced this in your life. When you start lying, it, it's, it, it's like a, 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 a roller coaster effect. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what lies do. They metastasize. When you do that, When you throw, you, you, you're prone to throw off all restraint to get what you want, even if it means desecrating something God has declared to be holy. That's exactly what Jacob's son are doing here. They're willing to even take the covenant sign of being set apart for God and to profane it and use it as a tool to get what they want, which is revenge. They deceive Hamar and Shechem with this ultimatum. Hey, if every man in the city, this is a trick, by the way, every man in the city gets circumcised, then we will become one people with you. This was a scheme to disable every man in the city. They had no intention of joining with the people of Shechem, and their plan worked because their lie was believed. But Hamar and Shechem now have to convince every man in the city to be cut in a painful place. So they resort to the same bait of avarice. They lured the men of their city with greed in hope of financial gain, 18, verse 18. Their words, Jacob's and his sons, pleased Hamar and Hamar's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamar and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city, that's where everybody gathered, and spoke to the men of their city saying, these men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives. You've seen some of them walking around. And let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us and become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Here's the bait. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell with us. 
And all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem. And every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Just do this little thing and it'll be worth it because we'll be able to weasel them out of all those goats and sheep and cattle that you see out there. It'll all be yours. They swallowed the bait, hook, line, and sinker. As I said, lies get bigger and bigger. You see how this, this, this lie is just getting so big as we see it happening in our world today and it, it lures more and more people into the devil's web as people believe it. But here's the darkest part of deception. Here's how the world, the flesh, and the devil all work in harmony, driving you to violate your conscience and to throw off all restraint. It convinces you that the end justifies the means. That's the heart of pragmatism, you know. The end justifies the means. Whatever works to get what I want. It persuades you that your cause is so noble, so good, that no matter what you have to do to accomplish it, it will be worth it. In this case, that's called vigilante justice. Jacob and his son saw themselves like Wild West cowboys, like Josie Wales. I aim to make it right. Look at verse 25. On the third day when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, they were blood kin to Leah. They were both the sons, I mean, yeah, blood kin to Dinah. They were both the, the sons of Leah. Dinah's brothers took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. How did two men kill every man in the city? Because they're all incapacitated. They killed Hamar and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. You have to ask, where was Jacob during all this genocide? I mean, his camp was right outside the city. Scripture tells us that. And so all of the screaming and the, the chaos, you couldn't miss it. He was strangely passive. It's almost like he inwardly approved. We're not told. But it gets even worse, 27. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. And so driven by this self-righteous sense of getting even, Simeon and Levi justified not only murdering every man in the city, finishing up with Hamar and Shechem, but rescuing Dinah was not enough. Like savages, they go on to plunder everything. They rape the whole city, basically. And they took all the women and children. I, we're not told what they did with the women, but it's hard to believe that there were any principles governing their behavior, given that they're driven by the lust of murder and revenge. Why is this horrific event in Scripture? Why are we talking about it today? You can see this on the news. Because the world's sense of justice, which is on full display in this narrative, is the polar opposite of God's. For in Simeon and Levi's justice system, a whole city has to die and their goods plundered for the sin of one man. But in God's gracious system of justice, one perfect man, one innocent man, one righteous man is given to die for the sins of the whole world. It's the polar opposite. Romans 5, 6. If you're not a Christian this morning, please, and you don't hear anything else, listen to this. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ 
died for us. If you believe that this morning, if you believe that God loved you, pitiful little you, pitiful old you, enough to inflict the justice due upon your head, upon his only darling son. If you count yourself among those who are redeemed by Christ, does your life demonstrate that you now live under his authority? especially in areas where you've been repeatedly wronged. That's, that's really the, the, where the rubber meets the road of Christianity, is it not? Right now, ask the Lord to reveal to you, gauge yourself, how do you feel and think about the people whose sin has wrecked and ravaged your life? How do you think about them? Are you secretly plotting some scheme? I'll get even with them. I, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll just give them the silent treatment, or I'll, I'll just I'll do this, or... Uh, Maybe one day I'll, I'll do this. The world's encouraging you in that direction. That's our last point. The allure of the world says vigilante justice is your right. This story of one young virgin being raped is sadly common to every culture and every age, sadly even to many families. But the world's answer to such grievous injustice is not mere justice, it's revenge. We want personal payback. We want to experience a remediation for the wrongs we have suffered. Think of some of the popular expressions in our society that you might even imbibe yourself. I don't get mad, I get... Payback is hell. Revenge is sweet. Some of you are thinking those things right now, and there's grace to repent of that. But if you do believe the gospel, God prescribes a better way for you and I, Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil. All all that does is perpetuate evil. When you sin against somebody because they sinned against you, all that does is metastasize evil in the world, brings no glory to God, and it makes Satan tickled pink. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. All people are not gonna wanna be at peace with you, but you have a responsibility as far as it depends on you. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written in indelible ink, vengeance is mine, I will repay. I will repay, says the Lord. I believe some of you are trying with all your might to do just that. But every time the pain of your having been done wrong, resurfaces. You're trying to believe that God will repay. You're trying to let that quell all of the emotions that you have. But you can't figure out how to get healing from all of that hurt. How can the numbness of the nerve damage done to my heart go away? Paul says, instead of planning ways to get even, be proactive, become proactive in demonstrating the same unmerited love of God to your enemies that God has shown to you. He continues in verse 20 of Romans 12. To the contrary, instead of getting even, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what we want as, a, as individuals, as, as families, as, as a church family. Instead of taking into account a wrong suffered and instead of letting that wrong suffered turn to bitterness and then trying to figure out ways to deal with that bitterness on our own power, God says, receive my love. Receive that you were my enemy. 
You had been thumbing your nose at me and wronging me and polluting my mind as I know everything for your whole life. But as you were my enemy, I sent my son out of love to die in your place on the cross and raised him from the dead on the third day so that as you trust in him, as you release all of your pain to him, as you ask him to be glorified in your life instead of you getting what you want, that you will bring me glory. And you can, th- this love is not a, a one-time thing. That The Holy Spirit is a river of God's love that continually flows into us, especially as we fellowship with him in his word. And as you receive his love, then say, okay, I'm gonna love my enemies like you love me, God. Give me grace to do that. Sons of Israel had not tasting the living water that empower such radical love towards their enemies. And so Jacob blamed them for his now having to leave his little detour into prosperity in Shechem. Verse 30 and 31. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, remember these are the sons of, of, of Leah. This is significant. This is not his darling Joseph you brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, they're, they're not going not gonna to change. Should our sister be treated like a prostitute? Does the end not justify the means, Dad? That was their operating principle. I would ask you to examine yourself this morning. What is your operating principle towards the people who have wronged you? Beware of the tempting allure of allowing your emotions and your fears to mix in with worldly ways because they're against the clear commands of Scripture. Let's pray together.